Cool. So, everything we've done so far has been supervised learning. So, let's recap what that means by supervised before we get to unsupervised. So, we've had P predictors, x1 to xp, and a response variable y. Do you have a second? I can borrow from Dow. I'm sorry, Jonathan. No, that's fine. Unfortunately, I've only got black or red. That's black. Black. Can you pass that and what we've been trying to do is find the relationship between y and x. Either so we can explain the relationship or we can use it for prediction. But in supervised learning, we're only going to have the predictors. So the, the classic question whenever you do supervised learning is, is it right? You don't have that. I know you can't use the y to say if it's right, but at least you can do cross validation and the k. A lot of it with unsupervised learning is about exploratory data analysis. It's about trying to find some representation that's easier to have a look at. Okay. So we're going to look at a few of these. We're going to look at principal component analysis. Then we, I can't remember what we do on Wednesday. I need to remember that before we do it. And then we do MDS, so multidimensional scaling. Oh, we do cluster analysis. But the key idea is you have all these predictors and we're trying to see if there's some sort of often lower dimensional representation or some way of looking at what's happening. So first thing I'm going to look at is principal components analysis. Just to warn you, there is a thing called a principal coordinates analysis, which I didn't know about until I started to do some um, sort of biome type work. But it's definitely principal components analysis we're doing with this. So. Let's think about what we're trying to do. So let's go back to this idea. I've got P predictors, X1 up to XP. And I want to see the relationships between these. Now the first thing you can do is you can look at all the possible pairwise scatter plots. You know, so there's P choose two. But the problem is if you know if you're looking at real data, you could have P hundred predictors easily. And now you've got to look at 4950 scatter plots. So it becomes really hard to see relationships and important relationships really quick. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at PCA, or physical component analysis, and it's a method that will give us a low dimensional representation of the data. The idea is we're going to represent it as a whole new set of principal co coordinates, components, sorry, I'm getting confused myself now. And hopefully this will now give us a, an explanation at a lower dimension, less than P. So you can say, well, how can I choose this lower dimensional representation? I want to find a lower dimensional representation that contains as much as possible of the variation. So the thing we're trying to do is say, there's variability in our data. We want to maintain that variation, that variability, in lower dimensions. And these lower dimensional representations are called the principal components. So let's set up. I'm going to show you how to do the first two principal components. I'm not going to go much further than that. It's sort of more the same. So the first principal component of a set of predictors is going to be, so we've got our x1 up to xp, and we're going to consider a normalized linear combination. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, my z1, my first principal component, which I denote by z1, is going to be some coefficient, phi11, one, one, times by the first predictor, plus phi21 times the second predictor plus dot. So it's a linear combination of my predictors. And I'm going to choose it such that I has, it's, out of all the principal components, it has the largest variance. Now I'm going to normalize this. So I normalize, I mean that the summation of my coefficients when I add it all up together. So I take each coefficient, I square them, I add them together, that will be one. You think about it, you have to do that because if I just keep making the coefficients larger and larger and larger, my variance will get larger and larger and larger. If I can have complete freedom, I just need to set phi 1, 1, phi 2, 1, etc. all to infinite, and I've really maximized my variance. So we have to have a constraint, and the constraint I'm going to have is that the sum of the phi squared equals 1. Also, that will have some nice properties in a second when I actually derive it. So this one, the choice of the summation of the phi squared, the fact that we've normalized that 
loadings, as we'll learn in a second, is to give some nice properties. So as I said, these coefficients I multiply by, I call them loadings. You can see that in, in the terminology. Is there any more of them cupcakes? I might just, because they were particularly nice. Thank you. Can I have as many as you want? Please, I do not want to take cupcakes, no. I can never remember, do you just randomly choose one to be poison, so it's a binomial, or do, you, do I just keep doing it until I die and it's a geometric? I can never quite remember how you've done it. I can't open it now. You should so. tell people how Go on, that's you, should, you, you should tell the people at home how delicious the cupcakes are. They are delicious. Yeah. Do they not realise how delicious these cupcakes are? And I can't believe that George Clooney turned up to the lecture. Good to see you, George. Thank you very much. You're very quiet, George. But anyway. Done. Let's see about mathematics for this. Um, if you want to know more about PCA, the classic canonical text is Jolifi, J-O-L-I-F-F-E. If you want to get a copy of it, I have a PDF of it. So our first principal component is going to be A1T. So I put them loadings into a vector and call it alpha one. So that is my linear combination in linear algebra. Alpha one T transpose times by random vector oh, stuff. And we're going to assume that the variance covariance of these set of random variables, so that x, bold x, is just my x1, x2 up to xp, is going to be sigma. So let's say, if we have p predictors, that's going to be a p times p matrix that will be symmetric. So, first of all, hopefully you remember this, but the variance of a linear combination times a random variable x is alpha 1 transpose sigma alpha 1. So that's the linear algebra version of the variance of a x is a squared variance of x. So let's think about our problem. We want our first principal component to maximize alpha 1 transpose sigma alpha 1 such that alpha 1 transpose alpha 1 equals 0. That's the idea I said that it's basically this vector of loadings has length 1. That was a non line. So, how are we going to do that? Well, we use Lagrange. And if you have a maximization problem with a nice simple constraint, we use Lagrange. So what does Lagrange do? It takes your heuristic minus, and then you add an extra parameter lambda, times by your constraint. So I've written that constraint that equals one as alpha one transpose alpha one minus one. If you can't remember Lagrange multipliers, go and have a look at a first year calculus textbook. They usually describe it. So I take that, and what I do first of all is I'm going to differentiate with respect to alpha 1. So, you know, right at the start, we looked at how we do calculus on matrices and vectors. So I'm not going to show you again. You can get that to be sigma alpha 1 equals lambda alpha 1. So I take a matrix and multiply it by a vector. And I get the same vector out multiplied by a scalar, which is lambda which is, means that obviously alpha 1 and lambda form an eigenvector, an eigenvalue of sigma. Mm -hmm. So in case you forgot, the whole idea is if I can take a matrix, the whole idea of a matrix often, especially this one which is a nice p by p, is it's a linear transformation. So basically I can take a vector and it shifts it around. It's either going to rotate it, stretch it, etc. Very so often I get a vector that when I do it, it doesn't move it, it just stretches it or squishes it. That is your eigenvalue eigenvectors. And there's various things about how many certain matrices will have and etc. But the main thing we need to know, if ever I get an equation that looks like a matrix times a vector equals a scalar times that vector, think eigenvalues eigenvectors. Again, if that's all news to you, a first year linear algebra, or just go to wiki and just search eigenvalues, eigenvectors. That's, a, that's much worse than a textbook for a <laughs> wiki. 
sometimes wikis are really, really good, and then sometimes it's it's almost like the equivalent of comments. The first paragraph is like, yeah, got it. And then it's like, someone got it and went, yes, but that's no way to explain it. This is how you explain it. Why have we got Hermitian, blah, 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 blah. Okay, sorry, we explained it clearly. So, Josh casually said, and it was a good casual, but which one? Because a matrix will have more than one. I just know it's one of the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, which <coughs> eigenvalue, eigenvectors, bless you. So let's look at it. I want to maximize, let's go back to what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to maximize this alpha one transpose sigma alpha one. Well, by the definition of the eigenvalue, I can replace the sigma alpha one by lambda alpha one. So I want to maximize this. Well, lambda is just a scale, so I'm going to bring it out the front. And because we said that this has been normalized, we know that alpha one transpose alpha one is one. So we want to maximize lambda. So all I do is I go to all my eigenvalues, I find the largest one, and that will be the appropriate eigenvector will give you the first visible component. Cool. What about the next one? So what do I want to do the second one? I still want to maximize that variance. So I still want to maximize, so I've got this new vector of loadings, alpha two. So I want to maximize that alpha two transpose sigma alpha two is large. I'm still gonna have the normalizing constant, so alpha two transpose alpha two will be one. But I want it now to be uncorrelated with the first one. So I want it to be uncorrelated with the first little component, which is alpha one transpose x. So we're just saying there isn't any linear relationship between these two. Well, let's just remind ourselves what uncorrelated means. So the covariance, so we've got the covariance of the first principal component and the second principal component. So alpha one transpose x and alpha two transpose x. Well, you can rewrite that using your covariance of um, random vectors as alpha one transpose sigma alpha two, which I can swap round by taking the transpose is alpha two transpose sigma alpha one. You might go, well, you just did a transpose, that's a bit dangerous, but the nice thing about sigma is it is symmetric. It's a various covariance matrix. That's really good, because now we know that sigma alpha one can be written as lambda alpha one, and I can put lambda as a scale, it can come out the front, so I've got lambda alpha two transpose alpha one. So these are generally all gonna be equal to zero if it's uncorrelated. And we can use some of these when we get to our Lagrange. So here's my Lagrange now. I have two constraints. I have first of all my heuristic, which is alpha two transpose sigma alpha two. That's what I want to maximize. But the first constraint is it has to be normalized. So I add, I'm gonna take off lambda. Now I know I keep using lambda, lambda, and lambda, and then sometimes lambda. They're different lambdas, it's subtle. I shouldn't have written all the subscripts in white, and now I realize my foolish mistake. But it's just a placeholder. So minus lambda, I've got alpha two, alpha, so alpha two transpose alpha minus one, so that's the first constraint that's normalized. Minus, well, we saw before, for the covariance to be zero, I want alpha two transpose alpha one to be equal to zero. So I go alpha two transpose minus zero. I put in an extra, I just put phi in there, just again as another placeholder. So the idea is I differentiate that with respect to alpha two, I would look at the constraints and solve. So, I differentiate by alpha two, so I get sigma alpha two minus lambda alpha two minus phi alpha one equals zero. I can pre-multiply by alpha one, and I get these terms. Now, we know that if the covariance is zero, that first term, alpha one transpose sigma alpha two, must be zero. That was on the previous slide. What about the next one? Minus lambda alpha two, Alpha one transpose alpha two. We also, from the previous slide, know that must be zero. We know that alpha one transpose alpha one is one, so the only way that this can be true would be if phi is equal to zero. So I now go back to that equation, substitute phi equals zero, I rearrange, and I get the solution must be sigma alpha two equals lambda alpha two. So again, our Solutions for this is another eigenvalue eigenvector pair. Which one? You can go back, you could look at them. But basically, 
you want now the maximum eigenvalue over than the one you've already used. And you're just going to keep doing this every time. You do the same calculations, and as long as they're always uncorrelated, and you do the big calculation, you're going to end up by finding that all your physical components are eigenvalues and eigenvectors of sigma. And the order they come in is just the descending order of your eigenvalues. It's lovely, isn't it? Really is lovely. I'd never seen that, and then I went through Jalifi's book and went through the first chapter, and it just laid it out really nicely. So there'll be other ways to do it, but I just thought that was the nicest I've seen. So let's now do it. Let's bring it back. So we're going to look at the US arrest. So this is data um, where they've got for different states in the US murder rate, assault rate, urban population, and rate. So these are just measures of things that people are arrested for in the US, I believe, in the 80s again. Yeah. The population. Um, yeah, uh, and I don't know what it is actual, we can go and look at the health files or ways to find out exactly what it is, but hopefully it's things like murder is not in thousands. I'm hoping it's <laughs> not over 100,000. I'm going to be a little bit disappointed if it's in thousands. And if you think about it, you could take all this data and you could look at it in four dimensional space and say, is there some sort of clustering? How do these things work? The principal component, we're going to say, that's too hard. We can't look at four dimensional space. Can we reduce it down to two dimensional space and see some patterns there? Now before that, I'm going to talk about a thing called a parallel coordinate plot, which is used a lot when you have multiple features. So the way it sets it up is on your x-axis is every predictor. On the y-axis is the value of that predictor. And what you do is each line is an individual. They're connected. Now in this one I've actually colored because I've looked at the iris data. And for the iris data we know the species so you can see them. These are used a lot because this one looks, you're not looking for patterns so much as looking for this. If you look at this, this is now the US arrest. So what I want you to notice is assault has huge variability compared with murder, compared with rape, compared with urban population. If I was going to think about a linear combination that's going to explain the most variability, it's going to put a lot of loading onto assault. So what we often do, and you'll see this in a second, is we often scale this before. In fact, you should really always scale this before you start messing around with this data. Otherwise, you find one variable will just flood it because it has all the variability. So we just scale it by taking off the sample mean, divide by the variance, put that individual column. Gary just has an example where, and it's an interesting one, looking at um, the carapace of turtles. And in that, that one, if you scale it, you lose all the pattern. So if you use the unscaled version, you can actually see some clustering. If you scale it, you lose the clustering. But most of the time, you really should scale before you do this. So here's how you do it. There's, there is more than one package for doing this. The one I used is the one that was in the um, James and Hal textbook that we've been following. So I'm using some built-in, it's called PRCOMP. So what I've done is you give it the data, set scale equals true, so it does the scaling. And what it does is it spits out here, and you've got the standard deviation associated with each lambda. You also, and remember when we did that calculation, we know the variance of that term is going to be equal to the eigenvalue. Hence, that was why we chose the max one, because that's the variance when we did it. So you get a standard deviation just by taking the eigenvalues and square rooting them. And here you've got your principal component. So you see the first principal component, you take murder and times it by minus 0.53. Assault times by minus 0.58 times minus 0.27 times the urban population times minus 0.54. So they're your loadings that you would multiply each value by to get it. So they're your fives in that model. The first principal, second principal, third and fourth. These are also called rotations because to some extent, and no way you can think about this is you've taken, especially on the scale data, you've taken your data and you think there might be clusters, 
and all the PCAs rotating it to hopefully show you the clusters better. So that's why you see it's sometimes called a rotation, like in here. Um, the head now will give you, so for uh, Al Alabama, when we look at the X, these are the principal components for Alabama. So we could actually take the first principle and the second principle and just plot these two to see if there's any clustering. So this is basically the values you get if you took your loadings, you did that X transpose X. Yeah, no, alpha transpose X. What I've done here is I went, fine, what I'm going to do is I took your SMS and I worked out the correlation. So that's the equivalent of me scaling it and then getting the various covariance matrix. This equivalent. And then I took the eigenvalues of that correlation matrix. And what hopefully you can see, I mean, after the square root of the values, if you took the square root of the values, you get your standard deviations, and you see these vectors now from your eigenvalues. Here's your first eigenvalue, eigenvector, your second eigenvector, your third. If we flick back, they should correspond to the rotation, the loadings. So it, it does agree. It's just doing basically an eigenvalue decomposition. And then the other thing is, I took my US, I scaled them all, I converted to a matrix, and then I multiplied that by them vectors. And you should find now these values match that. So all that's happening underneath the thing is it's just doing an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition and some multiplications. Here's my screen plot. You often see the screen plot. So to some extent, this is the amount of variability for the first, second, third, and fourth component. And what you really would like to see, you're always happy when you get a sweet plot and you see it starts off lots of variability to explain, it plummets down, and then it settles out. Coming down from the idea of what they call a scree slope in mountain climbing. So occasionally you'll get a cliff, and what happens is you get the cliff, and then bits of rocks have fallen down and they build all these pebbles at the bottom that then goes down to the valley floor. So that is called a scree slope. And that's what you want to see because he says, especially if you see it just slowly get down, you're saying, well, there's not sort of a cut-off point back to say, yeah, I can get away with reduced dimensions. This one, you can see that the first two dimensions explain most of the variability, and then it's just settling down. So this is a biplot. First of all, let's look at the black text. So what we've done is remember for each of those states, we have four numbers, which is the value of the first principal component, the second, third, fourth. So by plot just takes the first two principal components and plots them against one another. So the x-axis is principal component one, and the y-axis is principal component two. And it's not a good example, you don't see really nice clustering in this. It's not the best example, I just used it, we'll get some in a second which are really nice. The second thing they'll often do is they will put on, on the same plot, and now we use the top and the right axes, arrows that indicate what constitutes, constitutes each of the principal components. So let's think about these values. You've got murder, assault, rape, and nerve, and pop. What these are, they're vectors representing... If you look at your loading, you can see that First of all, murder, it's negative in the first principal component and then positive. So it's negative and positive. So basically they've taken them loadings on the first two principal components and represented them as vectors. So to check that, you can see urban here has quite a small component in the x direction and a large negative component in the second dimension. So here you can see assault agrees with that. There's your large, inf no, I've got the wrong way around, haven't I? That one there, sorry. Urban pop, small amount in PC1, large amount in PC2. Okay. And um, this one doesn't give you much because they're all roughly in the same direction. You see in the first principal component, they're all negatively associated with the principal component. One thing I haven't mentioned is these are not unique. These eigenvectors, 
Sometimes you'll fit it and you'll get them one way, and sometimes you'll get the eigenvector that is just the negative of that. Doesn't really matter, it's just, you know, they are equivalent. But you can see with these, um, they're all positively, sorry, they're all negatively associated with the first principal component, but the second principal component, murder and assault are positively correlated, while rape and urban population are negatively correlated with the second principal component. So this thing is called a biplot. What sort of claim can you make from that plot? Like, can you go to the South Carolina, Carolina's war for a murder state, or? <laughs> Like it just sort of happens to be in that cluster. It just happens to be in that cluster. I mean, I, I generally with this, we'll see in a second better examples where you see some sort of structure, some clustering structure. It is just a data reduction. You're saying that this linear combination could be used, they start, and occasionally you'll suddenly see, we'll see in a second where stuff suddenly appears. So you would use this for any tree? I'd be very careful about using it for that. So what, we want to see like little patches of points. I'll show you an example now to illustrate. So this one is for breast cancer. So this one we actually have a response variable. And what we do is we have for, okay, so first of all, does everyone know why cancer is called cancer? Well, cancer is the star sign that's the crab. Why do you think we call some sort of neoplasia after the crab? Because of breast cancer. Because of original breast cancer, they found that you often got a nodule, a lump, and you would get tracking cancerous tissue moving along. So when you look at it, it looks like a crab. It was like a body with legs going out of it. So the original term was the Greek or Latin? Uh, well, it's it can get in Latin, but. Yeah, so the Latin for crab, and so it was called cancer. Then over time, we now call it tumors and neoplasia and stuff like that. But the original word of cancer came from breast cancer because it looked like a crab. So in this one, what we've got is we have two classes of cancer, benign and malignant. So benign means it will grow and it cause problems, but it doesn't spread. Malignant often means it will spread further either through the tissues around it, or even worse, it gets into the lymphatic systems and spreads to the lymph nodes and then other organs. Benign is usually quite easy to treat. You just remove it unless it's too large. Malignant is a real serious problem. You have to remove it and then do some sort of chemotherapy. But it's really nice if you can actually tell this. Sometimes you can't tell. So they're trying to find a way of telling it by looking, taking a biopsy, looking at the cells, many things on the cells to be able to go, it's benign or not. Okay. So we've got a variety of predictors and we want to see if it's benign or not. So I'll do a little bit of cleaning if you want to try this yourself. I did a parallel coordinates plot. So each of these lines is an individual biopsy. The colour tells you if it's benign or malignant, and these are the values. And this is a very common appearance to a parallel coordinates plot. You really don't see anything here at all. You see the red's wrong in the bottom. Yeah, the red's a bit down to the bottom, the blue's a bit towards the top, but it's a little bit over, but there is a general structure. You can try and elucidate more patterns. Or you can do a really fancy GG pairs plot. So what we've got here is we've got our pairwise scatter plots. I've also got some density plots with some correlation all put there. And you can start to say the reds in the lower right, but you know, it's hard to see a definite good predictor or definite good pattern. So we'll PCA it. Because it's really hard once you get to this level of predictors to see the patterns. There's my PCA. So on my x-axis I have the first principal component, and on my second axis I have the second principal component. And hopefully you can see there's a huge separation now into that. Now, if I remove the colours, it wouldn't be as obvious. But it definitely starts to see some sort of clusters. But definitely when you colour it, you can see that you know large positive values of PC1 are very much associated with benign, while large negative values are very much associated with benign. So the idea is you're taking this and you're reducing it back down to smaller dimensions. Sometimes you'll see clusters appear. Doesn't always work. Um, I mentioned the scaling. What I've done here is I've repeated the USRS ones, but I did scale this time. Remember we had that huge variability? Now you see it dominates. When it comes to PC1, 
It's all about the salt. That's the main thing that is basically controlling PC1. And you lose that sort of pattern. And here's my favorite example. So this is work that was done in the UK by Donnelly and some other people. And what they did is they, each of these dots is an individual sample. They went all around Europe and they took samples of modern day humans. For fish, these modern day humans, or what I like to call those lots, they looked at their genotypes. They looked at what we call the SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms. So basically it's like your genetic fingerprint. And with that, you're just usually, for each step, you're just going to get a number 0, 1, or 2. And they took that 0, 1, or 2, and they just did principal components on it. So you've got this huge number. They will have thousands and thousands of SNPs. They took them thousands and thousands of SNPs, and they just did PCR on that, and said, let's have a look at the first two principal components. And then they were looking at it carefully, and they suddenly went, wait a minute. That's a sort of squiggly map of Europe. <laughs> And once you start looking at it, you see it. So this is Spain, then you come up to France, you've got um, Italy coming down here, you've got Greece, you've got Turkey, Cyprus, etc. and then you've got the UK. It's a nice example where they actually, they took, and it was just purely, they just taken lots of samples all over Europe, they looked at the SNPs, they looked at the first two principal components, and what separated them the most was ending up to be in this case, the piece of component one, because they had to rotate it, was basically the north-south drift, and then the second piece of component was the other one. Then when they coloured it, it just popped out. I think it's great. It's one of the classic, classic PCA examples with Darwin's analysis. The citation can be true, really. It's nature, yes. <laughs> and it's just... Populous magazine. Um, now, now, now I've got a nature paper. Of course, it's a populous magazine. Um, it's um, it's great eye candy, you know. And it just you don't want that sort of nonsense. I just, I just loved it. I, I spent ages trying to find this picture because I just thought it was pretty. And actually, came up quite quickly, which was really nice. Cool. That's PCA. On Wednesday, we will start doing cluster analysis, so k-means and hierarchical clustering. Any questions? So for the breast cancer example, yep. how do we actually use the model? Well, in this one, you could actually quite easily just use your PC1 as a classifier. So you've got this, in this case, a two-dimensional representation of your data. So we saw with PCR, we could just do some sort of regression on them principal components. Although in this case, I would do a logistic regression on them principal components. And then you'd have to undo it because you're saying there's a linear combination of those. And you know that linear combination is equal to a predictor. So you'd actually have to go back and look at that and try and work out how to do it. Now remember when we did PCR, it undid it for you automatically. So you definitely could do it that way. But as I said, mainly exploratory data analysis. It's about, I think there's two things I like about PCA. First of all, it, to me, it was the first time that eigenvalues, eigenvectors actually seemed useful because it just, it just pops out in the mathematics really nicely. But also it's, um, I have had a couple of times where you put it through PCA and you start to see clusters, quite nice separation, when, especially in a lot of the genetic work that we've done, it's separated, you can see it a lot nicer. Um, ben, in his MPhil, in his thesis, used it a lot, especially in his MPhil, did PCA to sort of show clustering in his population dynamics. But anytime you have lots and lots of um, predictors and you want to reduce it down to try and see the pattern, you should run it quickly through PCA. Cool. Any questions? Nice. Wednesday we'll do some more unsupervised learning. Um, the allocations are now up on the web page. There's a survey. You have an assignment due this Friday. I will be here this time, so obviously if you have any questions, come and see me. Um, that's about it. You have, after this assignment, you have one more assignment, assignment five. That will be our total number of assignments. Assignment five will just have two questions. 
nice, easy two questions. Is this the taxi one? Which, uh, no, no, no. We don't do sparkly R until after. Do sparkly R in week 12. So that doesn't give you enough time for an assignment. Now, this one is going to be two. One, I'm going to give you a load of data sets and you write a footy tipper. And you have to write a two-page report on how you did it. So it's about reproducible research. And the second question is you have to write a package with at least one function and put it on GitHub. Like any package? You can do whatever. It has to have at least one function, a vignette, a description file, documentation, unit testing, and a data set. Okay. Tom? How complicated is the function actually? It could be whatever you want. I don't mind. I mean, I'm not. I, it's more about getting over the inertia of writing a package and learning how to write a package. So if it's my my package at the moment calculates the sample mean. So you've got an idea of a lower bound on how pathetic it can be. <laughs> if you really want, but remember, you'll be writing a vignette to explain what your function does and why it does it. You'll be writing documentation, and also you're going to be incorporating a data set. So having something that just inputs the output will be a slightly boring thing. But I'm not having marks for how fancy schmancy your function is. I'm having marks for how well constructed your package is. Cool. Thank you all. See you Wednesday. Did you remove observations with NH? Yeah, I did NH. I removed personally, I found there were certain things that just would overfit it. So I removed name, ticket. There were some things that would just identify the person, so I removed them. Yeah. And then I did an NA omit after that. Mm -hmm. So I just trimmed down until just a few columns. And then I just run it to an error mint. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I decided to remove, I think there was name. ID. 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 Uh, yeah. Cabin and tickets. Cabin and ticket. Because yeah. they just identify people. You can't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The only, yeah, well, because if you, obviously, if you try to fit the age with the Mars model A and A values, it obviously spits out a warning that's the or Yeah. And then I saw that your data, well, your data set was described as a bit smaller than the one where you had stuff figured you'd remove them. Yeah, most slightly. The only thing I've done for name is actually extracted the title to a different column. So Mr. Miss Master Doctor and made that a factor to see if that has okay, it's nice. an effect. Did it? Not sure yet. Yeah, that's a nice that's idea. I like. I mean, most will be a list in a list with gender. Yeah. The only one that will probably be different is the the Lord, but or sorry, Doctor versus not Doctor. There's, yeah, the Doctor. There's a couple of reverends. Yeah. A... So maybe with that one, you might want to take it again, and instead of having um, maybe put educated in or titled or something like that in yeah, there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because I just think that your your miss misses will be quite alias between a mixture of age and mm. gender. Yeah. Nice idea though. I like it. Yeah, good idea. Thanks. Cool. Uh, when it comes to assessing how well the PCA is, do we just use that box? Is that the idea? There isn't a way of really assessing how good it is, other than how useful it is. We'll see that with K means you can sometimes get an idea of assessment, but no, there isn't really a way. Other than, did it elucidate a pattern that you didn't see in the overall data? Okay. So the idea is, if you do, then you can go do something like PCR. Yeah, yeah. But you, there isn't really a... That's what I said. Because there normally isn't a response variable. I mean, this was a derived set because we knew the truth. Because it's normally not that, you don't have a way of checking it. You don't have the equivalent of ROC and all the various things that we've used. So it is just a purely a data representation type method.